Okay, so now we are on lesson 11 of the summer quarter, which the title is The Trappings of Wealth. The scriptures covered are Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 17. Through the end of chapter 24, Lord willing, that's a lot of stuff. So Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you especially for this book of Proverbs, which is extremely practical wisdom. We pray that we would absorb it, that it may be ready to, for us to use at any time. And we pray for your spirit to guide us as we look at this section. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so the quarterly started on chapter 23. So I'm going to go briefly over what it skipped in chapter 22, which is uh, verses 17 through 29. Basically, verses 17 and 18, I actually decided to memorize this because I thought it was so good. It says, Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise, and apply your mind to my knowledge, for it will be pleasant if you keep them within you, that they may be ready on your lips. That's scripture memory, isn't it? Right? You want to keep God's word within you so that it will be ready on your lips when it's needed. Okay, is a very good example of that for us. So then verse 24, do not associate with the easily angered because they'll rub off on you. And verse 26, do not borrow or co-sign loans. This is not the first time we've seen this in the Proverbs. You don't want to be in debt. You don't want to put yourself at risk for someone else's loan, um, which is, talk about practical. That is very practical. So just don't do it. Okay, so section A then is deceptive riches, and that is uh, verses 1 through 8 of chapter 23. Anybody want to read that? Can you? That would be lovely. When you sit down. Okay, thank you. There were nine do nots in that. Yeah. And that really struck me. A lot of do nots. Do 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 nots. I can see the finger. Yeah. (laughs) The mama's finger. Yeah, I heard someone say, one of my favorite preachers, Andy Woods, you know, when the Lord says, do not, thou shalt not, he is protecting something. It's a protection of something, you know. Thou shalt not commit adultery. What is he protecting? He's protecting marriage. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet. He's protecting private property, you know. So what, thou shalt nots are protections for things that are good that the Lord is protecting. So deceptive riches, it talked a lot about riches there, and riches are deceptive. Because we think that they are stable. And this tells us that no, riches are not stable. So verses 1 through 3. When you sit down to dine with a ruler, consider carefully what is before you and put a knife to your throat. If you are a man of great appetite, do not desire his delicacies, for it is deceptive food. What do you think he's talking about there? Yeah, when you dine with a ruler, consider it carefully. Don't eat too much. (laughs) The quarterly had an example of this. So this is uh, like a scenario they made up. Mac is the chief accountant for a small company owned by Big Al. The other night, Big Al treated Mac to dinner at the most fashionable restaurant in town. As they were topping off the meal with a chef's own dessert creation, Big Al asked Mac to alter the company's accounts receivable to show less taxable income. Then it asks, how does Mac's experience highlight the teaching given in Proverbs 23, 1 through 3? So they took that to mean that, you know, when you go down to sit with a ruler and they're whining and dining you, be wary. 
about why they're doing that. Yeah, so, um, and don't eat too much. <laughs> I have never been in that situation that I can think of. But So verse 4, Do not worry yourself to gain wealth. Cease, cease from your consideration of it. Now, how does that go with our American lifestyle? Yeah, yeah, you know, we're, we're a consumer society. Yeah, adjusting your life to maximize your income is not a good idea. You want to follow the Lord. The Lord specifically says he will give you what you need. And he also says that you will work. He says if you don't work, you won't eat. So you, sh you should work at something. But you don't have to try to maximize your riches. You work for the Lord, you know, and he'll give you what you need. And he never talks about retirement. No. So then, yeah, and, you know, Solomon talks a lot about wealth in the Proverbs. And verse 5, isn't this true? When you set your eyes on it, that is wealth, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. Now, what is a, a way where this happens a lot, especially in our day, where you think you have wealth and you look and it's gone? Yeah, that makes me think about debt, you know? The other thing Solomon says is don't owe anybody anything. Because if you were in debt and you lose your job, what happens? You still owe the money, right? So you lose what you have. You know, if you if you have something through debt, you don't really have it. That makes you the servant to the lender. You're the slave of whoever lent you that money. And if you lose the means to pay, whatever you have on debt is at risk of being lost. And I think that's why Solomon and Paul also says, you know, don't owe anyone anything except the continuing debt to love one another. So then verses 6 through 8 are very much like verses 1 through 3. Verse 1 through 3 is talking about with a ruler, okay, it's a political leader. Verses 6 through 8 is eating with a selfish man. I don't know how you know if a man is selfish or not, if you don't know him very well. So yeah, do not eat the bread of a selfish man or desire his delicacies, for as he thinks within himself, which is selfish, so he is. He says to you, eat and drink, but his heart is not with you. Then it says, you will vomit up the morsel you have eaten and waste your compliments, which is gross. But basically, if you're, if you're eating with people who are suspicious, be careful. That's what it's saying. There's two examples there. You know, if you're socializing with people who are uh, sinful or deceiving or conniving, be careful. That's true. Yeah, and that's what that's what it's saying here too, right? Don't don't be make a pig of yourself right. if you're invited to somebody's place. But you know what I'm saying though is is is. Okay, well that's great. So, um, but we. Uh, riches are deceptive. So, section B, wisdom's discipline. So that's verses 9 through 18. I'll read that one. Do not speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of your words. Do not move the ancient boundary or go into the fields of the fatherless. For their Redeemer is strong. He will plead their case against you. Apply your heart to discipline and your ears to words of knowledge. Do not hold back discipline from the child. Although you strike him with the rod, he will not die. You shall strike him with the rod and rescue his soul from Sheol. My son, if your heart is wise, my own heart also will be glad and my inmost being will rejoice when your lips speak what is right. Do not let your heart envy sinners, 
but live in the fear of the Lord always. Surely there is a future, and your hope will not be cut off. Okay, so what do you think of that one? In this section, the sage, now th this is something that they said in the quarterly that I would not have noticed if they hadn't pointed this out. Solomon's thought to write from the write the Proverbs probably from the beginning, but certainly from chapter 10 through 22:16. You know, the beginning of chapter 10 says these are the Proverbs of Solomon. And then in 22:17, it switches and said, "Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise." And so somebody somewhere says, okay, maybe that's not Solomon. It's uh, some other sages. Now, how they decided that, I don't know, because we know that Solomon was wise because God gave him wisdom. Oh, someone that they think is the, this wise person? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that, but, you know, that's what Bible scholars do. They look around for stuff like that. <laughs> so one thing we know is that if it is in God's Word, it is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and so it is inerrant in the original writings and can be trusted. So that is why that is why we do what we're doing now. This this book is really old, and we come here every week and we look at it. Why do we do that? Because it's eternal. It's not just old. It is eternal. It is inerrant. It is the real, only re really reliable thing we have in life to guide us. So anyway, verse 9. Do not speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of your words. Has anyone ever experienced this? So you might do it once and get a response like that. And then what's he say? Don't do it anymore. You know? Because it's worthless. Yeah. Are you talking about don't throw your pearls to the swine? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's exactly the same. So basically, the attainment of wisdom and righteousness requires a willingness to learn from the correction of others. And nobody likes that. Naturally, nobody likes to be corrected, you know, but that's what the attainment of wisdom and righteousness <laughs> requires that of us. We need to be willing to be corrected. And the fool doesn't need correction in their own mind, and so they won't listen to you. That's what makes them a fool. Yeah, so then he goes on to verse 10. Do not move the ancient boundary or go into the fields of the fatherless. What What is he talking about, the ancient boundary? Yeah, in Israel, the property lines were made by God, by Lot. The, the priests and Joshua cast lots to decide where the property lines of the tribes would be. And each person within this, each family within this, had their own property line that was decided by God, you know. And so, and that's why they have all these land things in Israel where, you know, the year of Jubilee, all the debts are to be released. Everyone's to go back to their ancient land, you know, even if they've had to sell it because they were poor. And so, so this is, you know, yeah, don't move the property lines. Now, we don't have that here, right? We buy and sell property all the time, things like that. But the principle is the same. Don't move the property line because that's theft of property, <laughs> you know? property returned? I can't remember. I know at, at the year of Jubilee, all debts were canceled. Uh, every 50 years, yeah, the year of Jubilee. So in the 50th year. Yeah, I know that every uh, seventh year they were to keep a Sabbath for the land, so they were not to till the land every seventh year, which they ignored that for a long time, and that got them sent into captivity in Babylon. So, you know, 
if if you take the fatherless, the fields of the fatherless, God Himself will go against you. That's what it's saying there. If you tried to steal the the, yeah. you mean today? Yeah. Oh yeah, that happens all the time today. Well, God is against them. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. So um, that's that's how we apply that one. Verse 12, listen to your father who begot you, and do not despise your mother when she is old. Now, this goes against human nature in teenagehood, doesn't it? The teenager always knows best. So the teenager needs to listen to this. And actually, you know, the older I got past teenagehood, the more I realized that this was true. Listen to your father, who begot you, you know. Oh, I skipped one. No, I skipped a whole bunch. That's that's from the next section. I should be on, apply your heart to discipline and your ears to words of knowledge. Okay, so we're back on track here. So yeah, we want to actively seek knowledge. That's what we're doing today. When you read your Bible, you're seeking knowledge. When you listen in a Bible church to the sermon, you're getting knowledge. That's very important, but that's not the end. Right? The end is to act on what you know. Yeah, Jesus said, remember when he washed the disciples' feet? He says, Blessed, you know, I'm showing you what to do. That's knowledge. Blessed are you if you do this. So the blessing comes with the action. You know, you knowledge is required. You have to have the knowledge, otherwise you don't know what to do. But you are not blessed if you know it. You're blessed if you do it. And uh, and that is discipleship. That's discipleship and the blessing of discipleship. So verse 13 and 14, now th this goes way against the grain of our culture right now. I mean, I think in Canada they'll throw you in jail for stuff like this. It says, do not hold back discipline from the child. Although you strike him with a rod, he will not die. You shall strike him with a rod and rescue his soul from Sheol. Anybody here apply capital punishment to their children? Not capital <laughs> No, not capital punishment. I thought about it. No. No, but corporal punishment. Yeah. Th this will not destroy a child. This will never destroy a child. Why? Because it's in God's word. Yes, it will not destroy a child. Of... I would. This that's a place for civil disobedience. I that is a place for civil disobedience. I know if it was oh, in the states. Okay, yeah. Well, it doesn't surprise me, but <clears throat> so this is the quarterly had a comment on this, which I thought was pretty good. You know, uh, Suzanne and I had a book when the girls were little, I think it was Raising Children God's Way was the name of it or something, and it talked about how to do this lovingly without anger, you know, the, the, biblically. And we, we did that, and it helped. It worked, you know. God's Word works. It works when you do it. But anyway, this is... It says, correction is only a part of discipline necessary when a child willfully does what he or she knows is wrong. Yeah, you only use corporal punishment if your child is defiant against you. That has to be stopped. Defiance. So, if the child is simply making a mistake apart from any willful defiance, then the child should be corrected gently and praised for his or her efforts. Correction should always be preceded by training and instruction so that the child knows the right things to do. So you can't punish a kid for something you haven't taught them yet. You have to teach them first what you want them to do or don't want them to do. And the correction comes when they continue to go the wrong way. So, and this is, I think this is a very important correction, should never be carried out as a way for a parent to vent his or her anger. 
The goal of correction should always be redemptive, and it should always be administered with love. Yeah. I mean, what we did, I still remember it. We had infractions on the refrigerator. And how many swats with a wooden spoon you would get for the infraction. Yeah. Yeah, and you have to wait, especially if they make you really mad. You have to wait. And then you have to go back, huh? and you tell them, but what did you do? You want a confession, right? First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you want a confession. Okay. And that what I would do is I would forgive them right then. Okay, you confess, I forgive you. Then I would say, I have to do this. And I would do it. And then I would hug them. And then I'd start crying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because I always cried. So anyway, yeah, you know, the, the authorities who think they know what's best say that this should not be done, and this is a place for civil disobedience. This must be done. Right, be, you know, because um, people do it in anger, and they take out, and, you know, and then they're not a parent, they're a bully. Yeah, if you're a, a bully, yes. But so it needs to be done correctly, as the Lord describes, but it must be done. The reason it's, or you get what we have today. You get a bunch of Charles Manson's running around, you know. So, and that's part of the job. I think it's a big part of the job of a parent is to civilize their child. You know, children are born, they are baby terrorists. <laughs> When they're born, why they have this in nature? They do whatever they want, you know. And so, part of a big part of parenting is civilizing the terrorist. They're cute terrorists at first, but as they grow, that cuteness goes away, you know, if they continue in terrorism. So anyway, this is something that, that you know very strongly. I believe civil disobedience is needed. You, we obey God rather than man in this instance. So what, what is he saying? You want to rescue his soul from Sheol. That is the purpose of corporal punishment for children, is to rescue their soul from Sheol. That's why you're doing it. If you're being nice, you're letting them go to hell. That's where they'll go, straight to hell. So you want to rescue your kids from hell. So verse 15 and 16. My son, if your heart is wise, my own heart also will be glad, and my inmost being will rejoice when your lips speak what is right. You see, this is what you want. This is your goal you want. You want your son or daughter to be wise. You know, to follow the Lord also. So there is nothing like godly children to make parents happy. Yeah, so Second John 4 says, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, just as we have received commandment to you to do from the Father. He was very glad. When your children walk in truth, you are very glad as a parent. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, when they're young and you discipline them as they need it, they will make you very glad when they grow up. So verse 26, Give me your heart, my son, and let your eyes delight in my ways. And then it goes on. The next verse says, For a harlot, harlot is a deep pit, and an adulterous woman is a narrow well. So give me your heart, my son, or you may go into this deep well of the harlot, you know, or, or of sexual immorality. So he's warning of a very dangerous detour from the way of wisdom, which is either being involved with prostitution, harlot, or an adulterous woman adultery, 
And, you know, this is a, another theme that's come up more than once in the Proverbs. Sexual immorality will destroy you. And, um, you know, then Solomon had a thousand wives <laughs> and went off into idolatry <laughs> and died in it. Solomon went off, got into idolatry, and died without repentance as far as it is recorded. You know, will he be in heaven with us? Yes. Or he'll be in the kingdom. I wonder how many rewards he'll have. I don't know. You know, he was given incredible gifts, and the the kingdom of Israel was at its maximum, ancient Israel under Solomon. Then he went into idolatry and just, you know, it all fell apart from, from there. So the harlot, or anybody who is, uh, you know, to, looking for sex outside of where it's supposed to be. Surely she looks as a robber and increases the faithless among men. Okay, so um, we want to be faithful in our uh, marriages. Okay, anything more about that section? Okay, now we're going to talk about section D, wines, dangers. Anybody want to tackle that? Verses 29 through 35. Yeah. So um, who is this describing? Alcoholics. Yeah. Yeah, we, you know, we have talked about uh, wine before and the fact that wine is one of God's blessings, right? Blessings can be misused. And this is someone who misuses that blessing, right? Because it talks about, so in relation to wine or beer or whiskey, what is the sin related to that? Yes. Intoxication is the sin. Remember, the Jews used wine in the Passover. Wine itself, and we read that, that psalm, Psalm 104. Let me find it again. Okay, here it is. So uh, this is a God. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the labor of man so that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine, which makes man's heart glad so that he, make his face, he may make his face glisten with oil and food which sustains the heart. So wine, which makes man's heart glad. That's a blessing. The Bible routinely throughout condemns intoxication, drunkenness. Okay, and it's easy to go from having a drink. If you have too many, you become intoxicated. And what does intoxication do? It does this. Okay, this, this is a person who is very intoxicated. So they're beat and they can't feel it. Yes, they, they lose all sorts of things. In verse 33, it says, your eyes will see strange things. What is that? That is hallucination. Yeah. And your mind will utter perverse things. So you are inhibited and you begin to swear or cuss. You're, you, lose your, you lose your inhibition and you begin to swear or cuss. And uh, why do they do it? Because... It looks nice. Look on the wine when it is red. It sparkles in the cup. It goes down smoothly. And these are those who linger long after wine. Okay? So, and it starts out, who has woe, who has sorrow, who has contentions, who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? See, if you're an alcoholic, you tend to get your... Your immune system breaks down, you tend to get sores, you lay in the streets, you don't feel it, you get pressure sores, things like this, all the drunks on the streets. So um, the misuse of that blessing can have dire consequences. But to say that you cannot have alcohol is legalism. And we don't like legalism. That's a man-made rule. So, um, but if someone has had a problem with alcohol, don't 
have any around them. If what if somebody feels that is a sin to drink, okay, don't drink around them. That's Romans chapter fourteen, right? And so they should not. Exactly. Yes, and so they should not. And so there's a balance. There is a balance there. Okay, and uh, you know that's what Paul is talking about in Romans fourteen. If someone feels it's a sin then it is a sin for you to encourage them in what they think is a sin. So, um, but I've heard, I've heard, you know, churches say, well, you can't ever drink. That is incorrect. That is not biblical. And we want to stand on biblical. So, so I there you go. Yeah, you know, yes, you know, we're all sinners. Me too. I've done it too. And, um, yeah, and yeah, and you're stupid, you know that you do stupid things. <laughs> so, so anyway, we, we want to have the proper the proper balance on that. If someone you know doesn't is, thinks it's just heinous and they you know, okay, I had a when I've probably told the story before, but I was stationed in Honduras for six months and I had a little gal who. They made money by cleaning the rooms. You know, I had a room, and she was my maid for my room. <laughs> so she would come and she'd tidy it up, you know. She'd make my bed, and I would pay her. And uh, and she was a believer, and she felt very strongly about alcohol. And I tried to explain this to her, and she was not having it. And I said, okay. Okay. So I didn't drink. That six months I was there for her because she thought it was a sin. So, um, yeah, so, you know, I think if people grow in the Lord, they will realize what the Bible teaches. So someone who thinks it is a sin, that's a legalistic view, and they need to grow in the Lord, but until they do, you know, I do think that if someone has been addicted to alcohol in the past, they shouldn't have it again. Yeah, see, that's part of growing in spiritually too, right? Because for us, when we have a problem, we go to the Lord and we talk to Him about it. And and if we, yeah, and if we can't, you know, many times the things we talk to the Lord about, we can't do anything about. So we just lay it on him and then go away. And at Philippians 4, 6, and 7, what does that tell us, right? Don't be anxious. If you're worried about something, pray about it instead. You know, and the God will give you this supernatural peace that cannot be explained. That's what he gives you when you pray about problems. And that's much better than alcohol. Because alcohol doesn't do anything to fix it. If you pray to God, it'll be fixed somehow. You know, either the problem will be resolved, or He will make you realize that it doesn't matter. It can sometimes take time. Yes. Yeah, and that's a growth process too, isn't it? Yeah. So, in you know, I mean, for alcoholics, I've you know, I've operated on people who they drink a lot. You know. And you, you don't really know. And they'll tell you, you ask them, do you drink? And you say, yeah. How, how much do you drink? Oh, a couple of drinks a night. You say, okay. You operate on them. You go into DTs. They lose their mind for three weeks. And they're totally like this, you know. Perverse things come out of their mouth. They're hallucinating. They're having terrors. They're, you have to strap them down for three weeks. And they wake up, where am I? <laughs> you know? So it's, it, alcohol addiction is terrible. Yeah. Do, and so the idea there is intoxication, right? Right. I mean, that was so, thinking, Yeah. Yeah. So if you drink to become intoxicated, that is a sin. So anyway, Proverbs 24, let me go through that very rapidly. <laughs> 
So just these are just highlights. Proverbs 24, verse 6. For by wise guidance you will wage war, and in abundance of counselors there is victory. Counselors are good, especially godly, experienced counselors. Verses 13 and 14. My son, eat honey, for it is good. Yes, the honey from the comb is sweet to your taste. Know that wisdom is thus for your soul. It's like honey. If you find it, then there will be a future, and your hope will not be cut off. So wisdom is like honey for your soul. Verse 17, do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. <clears throat> That's a hard one. And if you do, you know what to do about it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there is a verse that I memorized that goes like this. Let me see if I can remember. It is Psalm 58.10, and it says, and I thought, that is so cool, and it's so different from anything else in the Bible, so I'm going to memorize it. It says, the righteous will rejoice when they see the vengeance. They will wash their feet in the blood of the wicked. Psalm 58.10. And now, how does that square with this? Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. Can you rec reconcile those two? This is David writing that song. I think because... I agree. And you know what it makes me think of? It makes me think of the Battle of Armageddon. In the Battle of Armageddon, it says that blood will rise to the horse's bridles for 200 miles. And who's going to do that? Jesus. Jesus is going to kill enough people that there will be blood up to horses' bridles for 200 miles. I think that's what he's seeing. I think that's what David is seeing. The righteous will rejoice, you know, when they see the vengeance. Notice that he didn't say he was bringing the vengeance. God is bringing the vengeance. And they'll wash their feet in the blood of the wicked. Because I've always been confused about that. But, um, but the Lord... <coughs> You know, he says, vengeance is mine, and he will do what is appropriate. So anyway, verse 19, do not fret because of evildoers, or be envious of the wicked. Sometimes I watch the news and it makes me fret. It makes me fret. I have to remind myself of this. The Lord sees it. The Lord knows. My job is to follow him. And he will bring... He will correct all this stuff. He may not correct it before our country is destroyed. Our country will be destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. Because we know that we're going to have a world government. And I think to have a world government, our country needs to be destroyed. But the Lord will correct it, and it will be fantastic when he does, you know. And we'll be raptured sometime before all this goes down, so I will be thrilled about that. And then verse 21, and this is good for me because I think about this kind of stuff too, which goes along the same lines. My son, fear the Lord and the King. Do not associate with those who are given to change. You know, I watch like what the FBI did, and I think we should just go in there with guns and take the FBI out because they're so corrupt. The Lord says, don't do that, my friend. <laughs> don't do that. I will take care of it. You know, you don't have to do that. Don't do that. My son, fear the Lord and the King. Do not associate with those who are given to change. You know, the people of God have lived under oppressive rulers all through history. All through history. You know, we had our country, we had, we've had a little blip of grace for 200 and almost 50 years. But the Lord is still in charge and control. And so don't be associate, associate with those who are given to change. Obey your government until they tell you to not discipline your children. 
<laughs> and then ignore them. <laughs> so anyway, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Proverbs, which are so great and practical. And we pray that you would help us to put them into practice. In Jesus' name, amen.